Hi, this is Nadia Jaksimbaeva, founder of Reinvention Academy and author of most recently the Chief Reinvention Officer Handbook, How to Thrive in Chaos. On today's show, we're talking about why it's no longer okay to reinvent every 10, 20 or 30 years, how you can do that with no budget in your company and what in the heck is the kill the company exercise. Stay tuned, I'll see you at the show. Welcome back to part two of our conversation with the queen of reinvention, Dr. Nadia Zev Zexembaiva. Zexembaiva, close maybe. <laughs> she is the queen of reinvention. She is uh, a, a best-selling author of several books. She has given three uh, international TED talks uh, in Austria, Slovenia, and the United States. She wrote the Chief Reinvention Officer Handbook as her latest, latest book, which is How to Thrive in Chaos. She, like I said, she's known as the reinvention guru. And we've been having a wonderful conversation about reinvention, about what reinvention is. We've talked about how reinvention used to be something that was done every maybe 25 years from a forward-moving company, but it was only needed by every 75 years. And now... There's a need, as Nadia was talking about, for us to reinvent every three years. And we talked about in part one how reinvention is not this project you take on, but rather an ongoing process. And before the break, we were talking about this resistance to change that is part of the human condition um, and the desire to hold on to things and say, well, that was then, this is now, it's all good now. So can we jump back into that, please, Nadia, that resistance 100%. in people who are saying, well, you know, it's good now, we're, we're over the pandemic, we're kind of in a boom and things are going well. Where do you, where do you go to with that? Unfortunately, that is part of that multi, multi-generational, um, few centuries old conditioning to this right. idea that there is a safe haven, there is a home base, there is a status quo to which we come back. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have to, of course, spend some time dismantling that conditioning, and it will take a bit of time. So what we notice, um, uh, right when the pandemic was starting, I was asking thousands of people across many platforms, is it a black swan, using the language of the mm -hmm. amazing philosopher Nasib, the black swan, a rare, completely unpredictable event. An yes. absolute majority of uh, people in the audiences, virtual audiences by then said, yes, it is. It's a black swan. Nobody could see it coming. And I would bring up a 2019 September uh, World Economic Forum in Davos report where pandemic was listed as a pretty much a sure thing among the 30 most important risks that the uh, World Economic Forum is um, ranking based on probability. So this is actually the most probable out of thousands of risks to humanity. This is pretty much a guarantee. So we have to rethink this idea that big disruptions are happening rarely and start noticing that it's actually the other way around. So another question I ask very often is how many economic crises do we face on a regular basis so mm -hmm. are we talking here and um, five crises and i asked something like uh since 1988 that's the statistic i have on hand how often did you how many crises did we have in the past and people tell me five ten whatever if we just count the uh, country level crises since 1988 we had 469 Country 469 world? financial crises in financial the United crisis. States since 1980 in around the world around, around the, the world, world. So since 1980 so in 40 years there's been how many 469 and if we add to that industry-wide crises regional and global crisis we're talking about about 1,000 crises since 1988. That's a crisis every two weeks or less. And people say, so why do I care that there was a crisis in Congo? What is the big deal? Congo is a massive monopoly in uh, cobalt and no device, no device exists without cobalt-based batteries. So if Congo is going through the crisis, 
you will feel it. If the boat is stuck in the canal, you will feel it in your grocery store. If um, right now Taiwan is going through the greatest drought of the last century and the water supply in the reservoir where they produce most 70% of the world uh, conductors and chips are produced in Taiwan and now they have no water, you will feel it at your dealership where in the US right now you cannot buy a car. Every dealership is empty because there is no chips uh, that um, auto manufacturers cannot produce enough cars. So we have to shift the mindset and we have to take a long, hard look at the data and realize that the world is fundamentally different and the data is coming from every angle that says you will face a disruption not every five years and not even forget every 20 years. It will be about every few months. And again, the only way you can deal with it is building a process that is proactive, that is looking at the anticipation of potential of change, that is preparing and creating multiple, multiple scenarios of growth mm -hmm. and uh, protection and so on. So I want to give you a pragmatic exercise, which we give everywhere around Reinvention Academy that you can use Today, no cost to you. It's famously used by HBO and many others. It's called kill the company exercise. Mm. You bring your company together. You can do a coffee. You can do Friday with drinks. Bring a diverse group of people. Divide them up in kind of mixed groups from different departments. And you give them an assignment to come up with the best, fastest, most efficient way to kill your company in the next year. That exercise forces you to notice trends, assess yes. risks, and at the same time, change the mindset inside your company that we are comfortable and that the pandemic is over and we are all good, don't worry about it. And of course, the second part of the exercise, then start doing something about it, right? Brainstorm what you can do to deal with different scenarios and then move into action. So you cannot just brainstorm, but just brainstorming alone deals very powerfully with resistance and there's hundreds of other things you can do in terms of dealing with resistance but we have to start looking at the facts and the facts are telling a very consistent story change is no longer a rare event it's a daily part of life so most of our managerial tools and leadership approaches have to reflect it i i, I love that exercise um you know, uh, Jeff Bezos, um, who is arguably one of the most successful uh, business people on the planet, um, has an exercise and, and that's very similar to this and where he went out and did his annual uh, 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 conversation to the management. And he said, uh, we're going out of business. Mm -hmm. And everybody went, what? <laughs> you know, this massive juggernaut went out of business. And he said, yeah, not today. But we, we have to operate like we're going out of business. So if we operate like we're going out of business, what do we need to do? And it's that same thing. It's that, yes. you know, understanding what looking at it from that point of view. And, and, you know, and again, from a psychological point of view, there are people who live their lives in the moment and don't make any plans. And, and I th think that's great. I've actually got nothing against that. And there are people who plan the hell out of their lives. And that's fine. That's your thing, too. Um, but your life doesn't really work that way. And there are people who say, I want to set some goals. I want to create some focuses, but I have to be willing to be fluid. I have to be agile. You know, um, I wrote an article that you can find. It's called Agile is the New Certainty, right? And it's that same thing, like right? Certainty doesn't exist. In your, the only certainty is that you have to be agile all the time. Bezos did that. And you're asking us to do that with this very simple but profound exercise, which is, okay, how do we kill this company? And you said HBO are using it, mm -hmm. right? That simple exercise, yes. right? Because it, 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 I love things that rattle the bias. I love things that rattle the complacency. And this is a, a wonderful example of that. When you look at that, I think that I imagine that it would bring you to the place of 
you know, there's, there's a lot of tribalism these days. And, and as a, we all see in that. Uh, we live in a global world that we're globally connected in every possible way. But we like to think tribally and we, you know, oh, we're Americans or, oh, we're Brits or, oh, we're Australians or, oh, we're, you know, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you just made a really great point, which is, you know, uh, child labor in the Congo is used for mining. Yes. And, and I'm in favor of changing the laws so that child labor doesn't exist. But the moment it doesn't exist, you're going to be paying more for your cell phone. Yes. And there's no water in Taiwan. And so there's no chips because the chips are going to be used to cool it to make things. And it allows us to go. This is not a concept that we are global. Everything is dependent on everybody else in different countries. And you use the example of the ship stuck in the Suez Canal, mm -hmm. you know, and people are like, what's that going to do with me? You know, and then they go two weeks later, well, holy crap, groceries have gone expensive. Or, I, you know, we had a conversation last weekend, my wife and I are driving, and she goes, why the hell is gas suddenly so expensive? You know, I don't know what it is in the United States. I mean, I'm in Western Canada, but it's taken a massive jump, right? So all these little geopolitical things that you think are sort of off there in the distance on the news don't impact you they do and they that ripple effect you know there's a there's a i'll give you a very quick story many years ago my wife and i were on holiday we we're on an island uh, here in british columbia and we're sitting on this island and we're sitting at the edge of this park um and we're watching as a giant ferry and you know those really huge ferries a giant ferry goes by and and we're just looking at it and the water's like glass it's beautiful and, and we're just watching it go by and the, the ferry goes by and, and we're watching the birds and we're feeling the wind and we're chit chatting and all of a sudden out of nowhere the glass the water that's like glass suddenly this wave comes and yeah. washes our legs and we get wet and we're like what the hell we look out there's nothing there mm -hmm. of course there's nothing there the ferry went by Yes. You don't see what caused the ripple. And that's what you're talking about, I believe, Absolutely. is we're not paying attention to the ripples and we need to. Am I on track with Absolutely. this? Absolutely. Absolutely. So when we talk about the competencies and the pillars of reinvention as a process, the very first pillar is anticipating change. We forgive my language, suck at anticipating change. We just don't develop enough tools and not enough priority to anticipate the ripple, because if you just built just basic tools, binoculars, you will start noticing a ripple uh, quite on time to adjust and adapt and so on. But unfortunately, we are so comfortable and we're so busy. I'm not saying we're lazy or stupid, absolutely not. We are busy and overwhelmed, but why are we overwhelmed? We're trying to crack a code, we're trying to it, it, it's as if we are already in the I know Iron Age, and we're still trying to get the iron out of the earth using the the Stone Age tools. That yes. is what's happening right now. And of course, your Stone Age tools don't work as fast, or they break all the time because they are meant for a different era. Yes. Things like just-in-time management, great idea in the stable world. Um, the beautiful invention that took uh, the whole world into a whole new world uh, around lean manufacturing, that you shouldn't have huge inventories of raw materials or finished goods, that you should have everything just in time, that the raw materials arrive just in time, that you don't have your cash wrapped around your inventory and that everything lives just on time. Great idea in a stable world. COVID-19 showed that nothing will be just in time anymore. So you have to put it on a shelf where it belongs and start developing new tools. I'll give you an example of this tool and all of the wonderful listeners, you're invited to get this tool for free. Just go on our webpage and download the 85 page book preview. At the end of that preview, you will get the tool that is beloved in our community called Stellar Strategy Canvas. 
how this canvas emerged. I was working with a massive mining company. And as a side story of reinvention, they decided they will go digital and they built their own tiny venture capital fund. Their seed amount was $300 million. It's not big by Silicon Valley to um, size. It's just a relatively small for corporate world. But they had a problem. The current business in mining and metallurgy is run by old school tools. And this new business, they couldn't figure out how to still have discipline, but to allow for agility and flexibility you're just talking about. Mm -hmm. So they said, Do you, is there a tool? And we couldn't find anything on the market. So we started developing it. And right now it's, I think, version 13 of the Stella Canvas. And we just started with two things. Number one, goals. Everyone starts the strategic planning with goals. Great idea. But how do you set a goal in a volatile world? How, how do you commit to a goal? Mm -hmm. We found research that shows when you move from a singular absolute number to a range, you almost double your chances of hitting somewhere within that range. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if you said, I want to be a market share of 8% versus I want a market share anywhere between 7 and 10%, you're much more likely to move forward if you have a range research shows than if you have a singular goal setting. The second thing, limits. The company used to very predictable, organized way of doing the budgets and strategic planning and so on. There's no room for pivot. There's no room for experiments. So how do you set that up? You create a limit. For example, your cost per whatever cannot go above this. That's a hard limit. Anything under, don't come to me. Don't ask me to micromanage you. Do whatever you want. <laughs> Just within those limits, whatever you want. Right, so right. these are the examples of what I say when I say new tools. Budgeting. You have to start doing dynamic budgeting. Budgeting once a year that is not dynamically updating and it's not really moving forward every month that is not moving and um, um, kind of uh, transitioning from month to month is just not the kind of budgeting that works right now. You have to have a budget that is updated once a month or more often, and that is looking forward in terms of forecast. Most companies we work with now have 24, uh, 24 month forecast based on the monthly updated budgeting. So you have to learn how to get much, much better in a volatile world. Profound. I mean, it's profound and it's insightful. So, you know, those are specific things to do, which I love. Um, but let's let's put it back on the leader. Mm -hmm. Because part of the challenge, you know, and you've, I, I know you would have confronted this as much as I have as a consultant, you're often dancing around the ego of a leader. Mm -hmm. um, who's, you know, again, you know, everything's got to change as long as I don't have to. Mm -hmm. So talk to us about reinvention as an art of leadership. What, what, what does that mean? Uh, it's a very difficult and very honest question. We have to start with ourselves. And once yes. we look at in the mirror, we also will start understanding who's in front of us when the CEO or board member or another executive is in front of us. Uh, so uh, starting with myself, when I grew up, and I grew up in the Soviet Union, so that's a whole other bag of worms. But um, even if you just strip that off and say, I'm just from a particular generation in the 20th century, what does it mean to be good, to be a professional, to be a leader? Well, number one, you should be, you should know what the heck you're talking about. You should be an expert in something. So that was old times, the new times. If I sit in a boardroom right now and there's somebody who says, I know exactly what to do, for me, that's the first sign of unprofessionalism. Because if there's anybody in the world right now who can say, I know exactly what to do, it means you're either not aware enough, or you don't know what's going on in the world, or you're not looking at data, nobody knows how things mm -hmm. will unfold. And we should be ready to say, I do not know. And I'm okay with that. And I am admitting that it's not my job to know. It's my job to figure out. That's a whole different story. So first thing is there's a lot of fundamental assumptions of what it means to be a leader and a professional in today's world. One is 
I must know that the, the, the new version is I don't know. Uh, there are other things around, um, if you used to reinvent your career in the past, you were flaky, you were unreliable, you were not quite there, like something is, you know, you, you just cannot yeah. get your stuff together. Today, if you are not upgrading and testing and challenging, you're probably not on the same track. Same with failures, for example. It used to be that mistakes happen behind closed doors, in the laboratories, mm -hmm. in focus groups. You never put a half big product on the market. That what? Why would you ever do that? Today, if you're not failing, if you tell me I haven't failed in the last sixty in sixty days, six months, you're probably not aiming high high enough. You're probably not challenging yourself high enough. Um, you should be failing. I've had massive failures. Just yesterday, we were closing a, a launch yesterday for one of our products. We're half at the sales target. And it's a fail. And I'm like, okay, that was an interesting fail. Let's figure it out on Monday. What was this all about? If you're not failing right now, you're just not leading most likely. You're probably following. So the starting point starts with us first and then the world around of us of leadership of understanding that the whole notion of leadership is changing the profession what it means to be professional what it means to be ahead of the tribe and guiding the tribe is just a whole different ball game and then we will have much more compassion for that ceo who is still trying to save the face and stand mm -hmm. in the podium and say, I know exactly what to do because that's what the employees are also expecting from her or him. You know, but when we look at that from the other side, um, for me, it's really interesting because I've had this, this battle um, and I will call it that uh, for a long time where I talk about um, there are these niche specialists and we were all told you need to find your niche and be a specialist. Um, and honest to God, often they are a complete waste of time. My opinion, my judgment, I get it. Um, because they're kind of like people who went to university and studied a subject like technology and they left university and discovered that everything they just learned in the last four years, they dedicated to and got a, ton of data for is now completely irrelevant and and in this um reinvented or constantly reinventing world where there is a global connection to all things i think if you only have a thing i think you're actually pretty useless as a consultant or as a leader and i think that you've got to have that multi-dimensional understanding of you know like you're talking about reading data looking at trends but also like how do i deal with the people and you know so from that point of view what's your guidance around reinventing the individual mm -hmm. um outside of that niche because we've gotten very identified with the niche and we're like yes but i'm a consultant and i do this and you know it's like well let me just <laughs> yeah so yeah. what what's your guidance for that with leaders who are who are in the consulting space and mm -hmm. um i love the idea of t-shaping this idea that you need to go deep and at the same time you need to go wide and yeah. uh, be able to build bridges between different disciplines and between people from very different uh framework or very different approach so um i i often meet strategy people especially please forgive me if you are working for big four but especially some of the big names the mckinsey's deloitte and so on. love you guys work with you on a regular basis but you have to admit you have an orientation towards finance and many other areas are not exactly the the strong suit at this point then you meet a change management leadership consultants and so many of them for some reason have a adverse reaction to finance to money to this idea of business modeling then you have innovation and design thinking people and they're amazing creatives but they don't want to look at the existing the the, the 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 legacy company that you cannot just cancel it out what are you going to do with thousands of people you still need to your new invention has to somehow fit to the reality that we have existing assets existing employees existing so on so 
uh, finding a way to build the bridges between rather than the warring camps? Is it Agile that is better than, um, uh, I don't know, Kanban, or is it, uh, what are we talking about? Is the design thinking better than the traditional disruptive innovation um, theory? It's irrelevant. At this point, look at all of this as a kind of beautiful Las Vegas all-inclusive buffet. And your job is not to eat everything, the fish station, meat station, fruit station, dessert station. And your job is not to say that fish is better than dessert. That's an absurd statement. Your job is to say, okay, for this situation, what unique plate is fit for the unique needs of the situation? So maybe today it's beets with, I don't know what, carrots and beef. And tomorrow it's cherries with pickles and what really I'm making this mm -hmm. up metaphorically speaking, but it, it, it's a different story. It's not one versus another. It's not narrow concentration, but it is very much about building bridges. But uh, does it, does it mean that you are not a specialist in something? No, you, we have to learn to get quite sophisticated and nuanced in whatever we do. It's not the time of kind of general brush strokes right now. I believe that the, the, the sophistic, the nuanced, thoughtful use of anything is required. And that um, comes back to the question you asked me at the very beginning in the first part of this, um, this podcast or this, this session, uh, when we talked about continuity versus change. Yes, we have to find our red thread. And when we know whether we as leaders or our company, we have to know what is it that is not compromisable, that will not be thrown away with the bathwater, that is not negotiable. And when we know that what that is, it's very easy to reinvent it because you know you are not betraying yourself. You're just manifesting a new aspect of who you are and your company is. But when you don't know, then you feel like you're losing yourself because mm -hmm. everything felt like a loss of identity, a loss of focus. But when you for sure know who you are, then it's very easy. And um, that comes back to the beautiful effort you're making to pronounce my last name. And by the way, I get an invitation to change my last name. I've lived in the U.S. since 98. I've, I've gotten an invitation at least once a week. Somebody says, you should Americanize it. You should, you know, this is hard. <laughs> I get it. It's hard. It's hard. But that last name, my great grandfather was executed for last name. My grandfather was in prison and killed himself after being tortured in 75 for that last name. That last name is my source of power. That's my red thread. That's my knowledge that if they could deal with that kind of disruption, I will be fine with whatever is happening outside of my COVID <laughs> world. So when I know who I am, yes. I have no problems be being a professor in one page of my life and then moving to being an entrepreneur, another being an author, and the third one consultant, another, and whoever else I will be in my life. Because who I am is unshakable, uncompromisable, and that applies also to your company, to your product line, to whatever aspect of your life. You know, what you just said there is so profoundly important. Um, so, you know, Again, I think that we, we follow these niches and we become the identity of the niche as opposed to doing the self-work to get really clear on who you are. And then you can put on the jacket. So you put on the jacket of being the professor. You put on the jacket of being the entrepreneur. It's a clothing that you wear. And just as if you might buy a beautiful winter coat and it's perfect for January, that's a terrible coat for August. Right? So you that. have to take it off and you have to put on something else. Um, and it doesn't mean you're throwing it away. It just means it's not appropriate at this time. And maybe you tear the sleeves off it at some point and you do something else with it and it becomes something else. But it's this, it's this willingness to adapt to the environment, but get solid and secure within yourself. And I think that when you resist the reinvention, you resist the change that is in front of you, for me, uh, when I examine that from a psychology point of view, that's got nothing to do with the world. That's got everything to do with you're saying, I'm afraid my identity is going to get shattered. 
And I'm saying, if that's your identity, it's already dead in the water. You're already finished. It's knowing who you are. So, you know, when you talk about your name and you talk about this family, family history and the strength and the willingness to, to go through those things, that becomes an ancestral hook yeah. into such depth of being that says, yep, screw up my name. It's okay. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I know who I am. If you pronounce my name, blah, 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 it doesn't matter because uh, I know who I am. That's a family second. Yeah. Right. That's just a name. Yeah, but it's the essence to it. It's the connection to who I am as an identity, and I love that. And I think it's a really powerful place for us to finish. And before we finish, I, of course, I'm going to ask you to tell our people where they can uh, learn more about you. But tell us in a, in in the simplest possible way, why does every company, no matter what the hierarchy is no matter what the labels are no matter what the c whatever it is uh in front of somebody's name why does every company need a chief reinvention officer because i know you believe that and i and i'm totally with you so let's let's sort of land that on the nose absolutely why everyone needs a chief reinvention officer and i'm so happy to see that already places like the state of north dakota have a chief reinvention officer at the state level why because in today's world you don't have a choice to change or not to change the only choice you have will it be on your terms because you have somebody who is paying attention to what's going on around the world and adapting the sales of your ship on time? Or will you be dragged into change, kicking and screaming by a new competitor, a new regulator, a new pandemic, a new technology, a new um, disruption of any kind? You do not have a choice. The only choice, will it be something that you are participating in excitingly and willingly, or will it be something that will be disrupting you, dragging you, destroying you? So my hope is that you learn how to ride the waves of change rather than be crushed by them. And the only way to do is to treat change with respect it deserves by giving it resources, by giving it attention, by giving it a person and a function that giving it time, that giving it agenda, and that giving it the necessary respect that the change demands in 2021 and beyond. Always a pleasure and an honor. Again, please tell our audience where they can find out more about you and all the wonderful resources. Absolutely. We would love you to test our tools, to meet our community. Go to learn to reinvent.com. That's learn all L E A R R L E A R N number two reinvent.com. And we would be happy to connect and give you some pointers on where to start with these resources. Thanks again. Uh, listen, um, there are so many fabulous resources there. Everything that Nadia has is awesome. It really is. Um, as you can see, as you can tell, she's an amazing woman doing powerful work, amazing leader doing powerful work. And I encourage you to, 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 to dip into those resources, read the books. You can find that you can find the books um, on social media. You can find them on Amazon. You can find them all over the place. Of course, we will uh, make sure that we share all the links to all of the resources so you can find them there again. Nadia, thank you. It was a pleasure and an honor, always an honor to be with you. Thank you so much. And for you, dear listener, remember that you can hang out with other conscious leaders. You can chat about this episode that you've been listening to or any past episodes inside of our LinkedIn or Facebook groups. Just look for the Leadership and Loyalty podcast. The truth of the matter is it doesn't matter how successful you are. If your employees and your customers don't understand what gives your company meaning, you're only working at a fraction of your capacity. So to find out more about how you can hire me, Dov Barron, as a speaker or leadership strategist for yourself or your organization, simply go to DovBaron.com. That's D-O-V-B-A-R-O-N.com. Because unified, actualized meaning is the one single monolithic difference between mediocrity and greatness for individuals and companies. I want to thank you for sharing the show with everybody you know. Till next time, stay curious, my friends. Stay curious about how you need to embrace not just change, but reinvention. 
And consider this, get curious about how you are holding on to an identity that is actually going to turn you into a Titanic. It's gonna sink you so fast. It's not just about agility, it's about getting really solid in the foundation of who you are so that you can pivot, you can change, you can be agile, and you can constantly reinvent. Change is not every 75 years anymore. It's about every couple of months. Be ready. If you need help with that, you know where to go. You can look for Nadia on all of her websites. I'm Dov Barron, and I'm here to assist you tapping into your deepest meaning to reach that next level of clarity, focus, purpose, and profit in your business, your life, and your leadership impact. And I am out. Thank you.